Good afternoon. This is Jane Wales. I'm Vice President of the Aspen Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. This is going to be the second in a series of, of conversations with foundation leaders on the question of how to go about strengthening democracy. So what is our role? What is the role of, of philanthropy uh, in, in doing so? What is the need and the opportunity right now? And for this this next hour ahead of us, we'll get to have a conversation with Stephen Hines. He and I will, will talk for a little bit in the beginning. I'll ask him some questions. We're going, then going to turn to your questions. So, so we're going to ask you to take advantage of the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And feel free to start posting the questions as our conversation goes along. Um, most of you know uh, Stephen Hines' background. It has been His professional life has been devoted to democracy strengthening. I think first when he he first graduated from Yale, I may, I may have this wrong, but he did go into Connecticut state government. And one of the roles he served in government was ensuring the delivery of social services. So understanding the way your average citizen is experiencing government. Um, he went on from that work from a, more than one role in, in government, but he, I first got to know him when he became CEO of the East West Institute, uh, which was an, a, an organization focused on helping the transition to democracy in former Warsaw Pact states, sort of after the Berlin Wall fell. Um, and, and there he worked to sort of instill the habits of democracy, help build the institutions of democracy, um, but, uh, and, and living in Prague. And when he came back to the US, he founded something called Demos, which is a, a, a public policy, a sort of a, a think tank kind of organization that focused in part, and this is interesting for today's conversation, on advancing citizen engagement in our democracy. So it's so sort of the policy questions, but also the role of the citizen. And most recently, and I, I, will start, I won't get exhaustive here, but most recently, um, uh, Stephen, who's president of the Rockefeller Brother Fund, Fund for now quite a while, uh, and, and, and the fund has a, a democracy program, but he also served as co-chairman of a commission on the practice of democratic citizenship in the 21st century. Um, and that's a commission that was stood up by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, it was an ex extraordinary document that it was produced uh, called Our Common Purpose. We'll talk a little bit about that and how it has influenced his thinking about the role of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the role of philanthropy more broadly. Um, so Stephen, I'm gonna to turn to you um, and I'm gonna encourage this telephone to stop ringing, but I'm gonna to turn to you and just say, you know, I, you've had a program at Rockefeller Brothers Fund focused on democracy strengthening for quite a while, but you've made a decision to add uh, to that program or, or you know, begin a whole new line of, of, of work. Um, so could you explain why? <laughs> Sure. Uh, first of all, Jane, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm really been looking forward to this conversation with you and with our um, our colleagues. Um, and this is a critically important moment to be talking about democracy. So, you know, it's it's very interesting. In 2015, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund uh, celebrated its 75th anniversary, and and we did a, a kind of a historical review and we found that there were three areas of focus that had been consistent at the foundation from 1940 on. And they included a focus on the importance of citizenship, um, of democracy, and importance, the importance of the environment, and the importance of international engagement. And those three things have, have been part of the DNA of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And They've taken different um, iterations uh, during different periods and with different generations of the family on the board. Um, and, but they, they demonstrate a long-term understanding of just how important democratic citizenship and democratic process really is. So we codified that a little more specifically in the new program architecture we adopted in 2003, where we created an explicit a program on democratic practice that has both a US and a global um, portfolio. Uh, but after working on the commission that you referred to, uh, starting in 2018 and issuing the report uh, a year ago, we came to the conclusion that the work of that commission had produced uh, so many important recommendations at a critical moment in our nation's history that we would invest in 
making sure that the recommendations actually get implemented, or at least that we make substantial progress on the implementation of these recommendations by 2026, the 250th anniversary. So we created a separate fund, time limited, specifically for uh, the ongoing work of implementing the recommendations of our common purpose. I'm sorry, you referred to a critical moment. Um, and I want to get a sense from you as the degree to which you might see our democracy as being in crisis um, and the degree to which you might see an opportunity now, kind of an opening as we try to build back better or achieve a just recovery from, from COVID and its, its various uh, effects. I do see both of those things. Um, I, I see it very much in crisis. I think, you know, democracy is not inevitable. Democracy is a choice. And there are citizens and leaders in this country who seem now to think that we don't have to make the choice for democracy, that we can have oligarchy or we can have autocracy and, and do very well. Um, at least some people would do very well. Um, it's not a new problem. It, it, this is not a problem that happened uh, with the election of 2016. It is a it is a crisis that has been developing over uh, probably about 40 years, um, and but it is at an acute stage. And the pandemic uh, really revealed just how acute our democracy crisis is. And of course, the 2020 election cycle further revealed just how acute the crisis is and how fragile our democracy is um, and how much work we need to do to make our democracy effective and resilient for the kinds of challenges we face in this century. Yeah, you know, the um, there often folks refer to the decline in trust. I mean, as you talk about that 40 year, well, one of the one of the, the characteristics of those 40 years was this decline in trust, not only in government, but in one another. Exactly. Um, it's concerning. But as you look at as you look at at polling nowadays, it, 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 it does seem to suggest um, that, that it's not a lack of trust in the intentions of government or, or, or officials. Uh, it's much more a lack of faith in its competence, um, in, in its relevance. Um, so to the extent that for a citizen, um, the, the idea of effectiveness and trust uh, go hand in hand, what is the role of civil society? What is the role of philanthropy in sort of helping in the in in in, in advancing effective governance in delivering uh, what the American public needs? Well, there's a lot uh, wrapped up in that question, uh, so I'm, I'm going to try to unpack it a little bit. Um, it is true that Americans have lost trust in our democratic institutions over this. Let's let's just use this four decade time frame. Um, and it is because those institutions have in fact proven less effective, less resilient, less, um, less able to deliver on the inherent promise of democracy, which is dignity, um, a decent quality of life, rights, justice. And so people, and democracy literally requires faith and trust. Um, John Dewey called democracy itself a civic faith. And so when you start to lose faith in the institutions, um, and then you start to lose faith in each other, as you noted. And I think the data suggests that in as recently as 1997, uh, around 65% of Americans had a good deal or a great deal of faith in their fellow citizens to make the right political decisions most of the time. And now it's under a third. We do not trust each other. And in fact, many of us see people of the other political party, not only as, not as just fellow citizens who differ, but as the enemy. And we've, we have really eroded the trust in our culture, our trust in the institutions, our trust in each other. And, that is one of the things that makes our democracy so fragile. So effective deliverance by government is extremely important. Demonstrating that actually democracy works for people is extremely important. And I think this is what President Biden has made a big bet on, in essence. Um, you know, he's, he is clearly concerned about our democracy. He thinks that the best way he can 
um, help strengthen our democracy is demonstrating once again that government can deliver for the people. And of course, many of the challenges that, that we face and we promise to solve as a candidate, um, huge, you know, end the pandemic, mitigate climate change, uh, advance racial justice. Um, these are challenges that cannot be solved by or even managed by one sector alone. That's by, correct. By the, all by itself, right? The, and right. There's not a bureaucratic structure that solves those. Um, so it, what that would suggest is a big role for citizens, uh, whether they're in the private sector, whether they're in the uh, nonprofit sector, um, and a role for philanthropy. Do you, do you see it as growing, or has this always been the case, that we're part of getting stuff done? Um, well, I think, I think the notion that we are responsible along with the other sectors of our society for this is, um, in some ways, it's, it's been implicit in the work of philanthropy, you know, probably forever, but I think it's become much more explicit. Although the response of philanthropy to the crisis in democracy itself is still not very robust, and, and that is worrisome. Um, but I do think there is a, a growing understanding that, and you can see this in the business community. We, I didn't really address your question about civil society, but we see it in civil society. And civil society to me, and this is one of the lessons I learned in that work in Eastern Europe that you referred to, is actually the guardrail of democracy. It is where citizens can work together to solve problems, to advocate, to change things, and to hold people accountable. And so without a vibrant civil society, you don't have a vibrant democracy. I, I think it's just as simple as that. And of course, philanthropy, in essence, is, is a major part of the economy of civil society um, through our grant making. And, um, but we need to see that connection to the strength of democracy more clearly and work to strengthen those connections. Right. So there's sort of three broad areas where Rockefeller Brothers Fund's work and the the um, the, the commission's um, uh, work clearly overlap uh, or clearly come together. And the first is what you've just been talking about, and that's civil society, the role of civil society itself, regardless of the issues it's working on, uh, but just as you know, a, a, an essential. Uh, part of the infrastructure of a democracy. And the second is what I would refer to as democratic functioning, but I think you're, in your literature you refer to it as, as institutions uh, and, and processes. And then the, the third is, is democratic culture, civic culture. So I want to sort of move quickly to the, the functioning part, and, and then we can come back to civil society. Um, as you think about um, the election year we've just been through, there were uh, sort of procedural questions that, that went to the heart of the effectiveness of our democracy and the integrity of our democracy. And you saw civil society organizations working on election security. You saw them working on uh, expanding participation in the vote and expanding participation in the census. You saw them working on um, uh, sort of calling out uh, digitally uh, disseminated misinformation and disinformation. Are these areas where, um, I mean, th that will be ongoing, there'll be other examples of, of democratic functioning where civil society has a role to play. And is these areas in which Rockefeller Brothers Fund works? Yes. Um, the, the core democracy program at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund really focuses, uh, because we, like all foundations, we have to focus on a few things and try to try to really do them in a significant way. And so our democratic practice US program focuses on access to the ballot and you know all, all of what that means, including suppression, anti-suppression efforts and voter registration and all of those kinds of things. The second is money in politics and trying to mm -hmm. reduce the implications of, uh, of our you know obsession with capitalism and its uh, influence on democracy. Um, and the third is movement building, uh, which is really the civil society dimension, because we really believe that in order to make a more just and inclusive democracy, it will come because of movements. We are not going to get it 
from the leaders without movements pushing and, and advocating for it, demanding it. Um, so those are the three cores of our, our ongoing democratic practice program. Added to that, and it's but it's very much related and mirrors it in a long way. One of the things that is distinctive about the commission's work is that most of these kinds of commissions focus on the institutional questions only. What are the what are the reforms of institutions and process processes that we need to, you know, to fix the problems in our democracy? And the commission decided. Uh, came to the conclusion from the research we did and from the listening sessions we held all around the country with Americans that in fact all the reforms to institutions would not be sufficient to really create the vibrant and inclusive and, and effective democracy we need. We have to address civil society and its role and strengthen it and we have to address civic culture and help create a more um, inclusive and productive civic culture as opposed to the divisive one that is the dominant culture today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, the report refers to civic infrastructure. What does that cover? Well, it, it, we're still in the process of further defining that. Um, we, one of our, I think one of our most important recommendations is in fact um, to create a national trust for civic infrastructure, which would be a significant financing vehicle to support civic infrastructure at the local level. Mm -hmm. And what, what we are, and we have a working group now really fleshing this out with experts that have been studying this and doing research and also with practitioners who have been demonstrating how this works at the local level. And, and what we're thinking of is kind of an analogy to technology that there are hardware dimensions of civic infrastructure and there are software dimensions of civic infrastructure. And the hardware are in fact the places where citizens can gather, can work together. It's the civic square. Um, so it's public libraries, it's parks, it's community associations, it's um, all kinds of places where citizens can come together, work with each other, solve common problems, or just do things together that bring them joy, like a garden club or a book club, or these are these are important parts of the civic infrastructure. Um, the kind that we're especially interested in is the civic infrastructure that adds the software of work to build bridges across various forms of difference. And we saw examples of this all over the country during the research we did for the work of the commission and these listening sessions where there are in local institutions and local citizens groups that come together, uh, bridge differences, find ways of working together, solve local problems, build common purpose, which became the, the name of our report. And that's what we think needs greater appreciation, greater recognition and greater financial support. And so the idea is to create a national trust um, in the first instance, we hope to be supported by philanthropy, but ultimately we hope it will be a public private partnership with government funds, local, state, some national, also uh, private sector funding, community foundations, national foundations, individual uh, contributions that would then distribute funds based on, um, you know, RFP processes, requests for proposals to support these kinds of bridge building civic infrastructure activities. And if we make a big investment in this over the next, let's say 10 years, I think it will have a, a, a really important impact on the quality of our democracy. You're, you're leading me to ask a question of, are, are you going to be satisfied? Are you gonna feel the job is done if you have not expanded the amount of philanthropic dollars uh, that go into strengthening democracy? Because you referred earlier to how small it is, and it's like two percent of, of giving falls in that area. Um, is part of your your no, role it, it, that there are more folks like RBF out there? Uh, yes, I think my colleagues um, are tired of hearing from me on this topic because my answer to your question is a simple no. I will not be satisfied. <laughs> um, I've, I've become a bit of a, a democracy funding evangelist, and, and um, people may be tiring of it. But on the other hand, you know. I really believe, and Ezra Klein put it so beautifully recently in one of his columns, he said, democracy is the most important fight 
because it is the fight that will determine the outcome of every other fight. And that is true for philanthropy, whether we care about climate change, which the RBF certainly does and many other foundations too, or whether we care about education reform or we care about healthcare reform, or we care about the arts and culture, we will not have strength in any of those sectors. We won't solve any of those problems unless we also have a vibrant and effective functioning democracy. So it's in, it's in our philanthropic interest to support democracy. And um, you know the data shows that on average over the last 10 years, and this is data from Candid, um, you know, the former foundation center, um, that foundations have been devoting around 2% per year of their grants budgets to things that broadly defined help support a, a, a strong democracy. Um, in 2019, the data was that it was 1.1%. Um, in 2020, you know, the anecdotal evidence suggests that there was an important spike. And you mentioned how there was a lot of civil society activity for election protection, for getting out the vote, you know, for uh, voter education, all of those important things. And there were big investments by philanthropy in that. So we expect when the data is available to see a spike in 2020, but the but we need to sustain this. You know, it can't just be the election years. Um, first of all, democracy is more than elections and it happens every day, not just on election day. And we need to be making a long-term sustained and, and larger um, commitment to this as a, as a field, as philanthropy. You note know that, that democracy happens every day. It's, it's sort of a job that's never finished, right? It's, right. Exactly. It's always on, ongoing. That, that takes me to the, the to, to the commitment you all have to, to strengthening civic culture. Um, in many ways, that's the most important right, of, of, your, of your goals, uh, but it's also the squishiest in right. what we'll understand from it. So I, I guess I, I want to ask two questions. I mean, to what degree do we need to return to the original ideas and ideals on which our country was founded? You know, ensure that we have a, a shared understanding of what that is, but also, I mean, I know that the our common purpose is about the 21st century. Also think about how our culture has evolved, needs to evolve, uh, and, and still be, uh, you know, produce that kind of vibrant democracy that depends on, on people and culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. The, the culture is fundamentally important and it's the most, in some ways, the most difficult because it is, as you said, squishy. It's, um, it, it's, it's, not um, structural, you know, it, it, it's what lives in the hearts and minds of Americans and how you, how you um, shift that. What, what we have today are culture wars. What we have today is a political culture of what I call civic antipathy toward each other. What we need is to get past culture wars and get to a culture of commitment to our constitutional democracy and to one another. We need to move from civic antipathy to civic empathy. We need to understand that we have a stake in each other's future, that the common good is the way we achieve good for ourselves and our family. And until we can kind of restore that kind of a culture, we're gonna to continue to have a, a democracy that is gonna fall short of what we need. But the work on that is very hard. Um, and part of it is reckoning with our history. You know, we have, a, we have America is, as many people have said, is really an idea. It's a, it's a noble idea with some sinful elements in its origins and some ongoing sin in its current practice. And we need to be honest about that. I mean, the, the story of enslavement, the story of Native American genocide, we just have to live up to this and own it, you know, and accept it and deal with it. We need to tell the story that, that talks about the glory of our history, but also the gory of our history. Um, and only by doing that are we going to achieve a sense of what it is we are as a nation and where we need to go. And that's, I think, one of the most important challenges of the 21st century. Can we create a, and it's not one story, can we create a collection of stories of what it means to be America and what it means to be Americans that everybody feels they have a place in. Um, and I think there's been too much emphasis on a story, a simple story. What's the narrative of you know, the arc of America? 
it's more like a collection of essays focused on a, on a common theme. And I think we need to start telling that. And one of the recommendations in the commission's report tied to the 250th anniversary is a recommendation that working through the Federation of State Humanities Councils, there be ongoing conversations, again, using the civic infrastructure, the local libraries, the, the civic groups to have conversations about our, our history and our, our present and our future and what does bind us together. And if we can come up with an American identity that is compatible with this vast, as Eric Liu, one of your colleagues and my colleagues says, this vast, uh, geographically vast, you know, racially diverse system of self-government, if we can come up with a, a story about what this means in that context, uh, that is compatible with the multiracial society. That's how we're going to succeed as a nation in the 21st century. Yeah. I'm going to ask you about the ways in which we've changed of late in, in expressing our citizenship uh, and expressing our generosity, but I first want to take some of these questions. Um, it is a question from Michael Feldman, uh, who asks about the role for coalitions of funders coalitions of grantees as well. To what extent is that part of the civic structure? And to what extent is, you know, how important is it? And, and is there a role for RBF and others in, in building and supporting and participating in those kinds of coalitions? Yeah. Well, thank you, Michael, for the question. The coalitions are, I think, important at all of these levels. So one of the, I think one of the reasons the democracy um, space is not as effective as we hope it will become is because it's very diffuse. And there are, you know, there are lots of groups. We all have lots of grantees. They're doing very good work, but they're not connected well enough together to build something that is more powerful than the sum of the parts. So one of the things we are trying to do uh, through our common purpose and through some of the grant making RBF is currently doing to help support our common purpose is to aggregate the power of civil society and of NGOs working in this space by linking them together more effectively in alliances, coalitions, networks, whatever, whatever term you want to give to it, it the question, you know, the, the, the story gets more powerful, the more we can work together. That needs to be mirrored by similar behavior in the field of philanthropy. And so we are also part of and trying to help build support for funding uh, collaboratives and funding coalitions to support some of these kinds of things. And there are a variety of them out there. And, and those, we all know that it's a lot easier in philanthropy to talk about collaboration than it is to do it, um, which is a, a paradox that I'm, I've been puzzled about for 20 years, but it, it remains true. But there are some very effective funder collaboratives underway in this space that give me encouragement. And I think they're very, very important. And then the third is we need some, some coalitions across the sectors. So we need some coalitions that bring in the business community, that bring in the faith community, that bring in the education community, the universities, and help them to be part of this story, help them to understand their role in the future of our democracy. And you're beginning to see this too, which is encouraging. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even in our program in philanthropy and social innovation, we have added a dimension that is focused entirely on cross-sector problem solving and trying to derive what lessons can be learned um, from, from effective uh, examples of that, but also take a look at, at, um, at, at kind of alliances and partnerships that are in the making. Yeah. The, 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 the next question I'm going to take is Stephanie Gosses, and, and she, she brings us back to the conversation about a crisis in democracy and asks the question of well, what role does inequality, inequity play? And I know you, you started to, to speak about that, but you know, asks if, if we can ever have a, a, a thriving democracy uh, so long as there are these sort of searing divides uh, that, that uh, sort of inequity is showing. Well, I think, again, I think the simple and honest answer to that question is no, we cannot. Um, democracy requires a, a, a certain level of social solidarity, um, whether that's across racial divisions, whether it's across gender differences, um, 
their and or economic status. There has to be uh, certain parameters of solidarity. And when those parameters are stretched, democracy really does weaken. And I think that's a major contributing factor to the weakness in our democracy today, both in terms of racial justice and racial equity and just the overall problem of economic inequality and inequity. And you know, the history of, of, of Greece and Rome actually proves that when wealth gets concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, democracy fails. And you know, we're we're at a place where you just look at what happened in a year of pandemic when tens of millions of Americans were suffering in so many different ways. And a handful of billionaires got just richer and richer and richer. And more billionaires were created. And at some point, that that's that kind of erosion of social solidarity in society will be, it could be a breaking point for democracy. The, one of the things we've seen, uh, at least pre-COVID, so of the 20 years leading up to uh, 2020, was that there was a, a, in fact, more money being given, but by fewer givers, uh, reflecting this extraordinary concentration of, of wealth. And, and the folks who were dropping out of giving were about 20 million middle-class givers. Yeah. Uh, middle class households. Um, but there was something that was even more concerning during that period, and that is the reduction in volunteerism. Mm -hmm. And you can say, you know, well, part of that is a reflection of, of the concentration of wealth because if you're holding two jobs, you don't have time to volunteer. But part of it is surely, or, or we need to find out if part of that is a concentration of agency, a sense that you can't make a difference. Mm -hmm. that it's the 1% that will rule the world. Um, and, and that raises real questions about, about democracy. Um, are you seeing those trends um, changing? In other words, are you seeing in this sort of moment of need um, that 2020, that COVID offered up, um, did we come back as more engaged as, as, a, as a citizenry in the ways in which we could while being on lockdown? Well, I think the pandemic experience um, was paradoxical in a lot of ways. On, on the one hand, we did see some remarkable social solidarity expressed during the pandemic. Um, people helping their neighbors, um, people, you know, taking, taking an elderly neighbor to get their vaccination shot. Um, and, and that kind of stuff is, is so much a part of what we tell ourselves, it means to be Americans, right? It's that generosity of spirit, it's that volunteerism, it's, um, it's a belief that we are in this together. On the other hand, there was a lot of selfishness, a lot of division. We saw it in the fight over wearing a mask, you know, of all things. Um, I'm not gonna wear a mask and I don't care whether that puts, you know, the rest of the people around me at risk. Um, so we saw both of those things. We saw a, a really challenging election environment because of the pandemic and the health concerns. And we saw extraordinary, you know, results, more, more people voting, more activity than we've had in normal election years um, for a variety of other reasons. But we managed the pandemic in a way that didn't inhibit our democratic process, which was really quite something. It was a triumph of democracy in that regard. Um, and at the other end of the equation, we saw an election that was contested based on completely false information, false claims. Um, and so well, these things are all happening simultaneously. So what worries me is that it just shows that this is all contested space and we do not know the outcome of the contest. And that's why I think it's important that we do everything we can to help determine the positive outcome of these contests. Um, and I worry that we're not doing enough. I'm sorry, you're muted. <laughs> we have a question from Nancy Lindbergh, the president of the Packard Foundation, uh, a, a colleague of, of yours in the Aspen Philanthropy Group. And she asked about the role of misinformation and disinformation um, and the degree to which it has driven distrust. It is so distrust and asks, what is what is the role of philanthropy and civil society in countering uh, that that danger? 
Well, Nancy is entirely right. This is a, this is a major problem, and this is not an entirely new problem. We know, you know, the history of propaganda and its influence, the history of demagoguery and its, uh, you know, its story. But we're at a different place because of the of the extraordinary capacity of technology. Um, and the extraordinary capacity of people to manipulate, the, you know, information technology to spread disinformation. And it is a really complicated subject. The commission spent a fair amount of time looking at this, and we have a couple of recommendations in the, our common purpose report about this, but they are recommendations that are um, re relatively modest compared to the size of the problem. And it reflects the fact that there's a whole lot more thought that we need to be giving to this as a society, and people are, which is good. And philanthropy needs to be supporting that kind of work because I think it's critically important. If we can't have a core understanding of basic facts, if we can't uh, have a core understanding of how the process works, if we can't have a core understanding that elections are won and lost and that without evidence of fraud, we accept the outcomes of the election process, we are really at risk. I mean, it's it's really a, uh, a frightening situation. So I think uh, overcoming the negative consequences of this media ecosystem and building antidotes is really essential. And one thing that we, we've been thinking about in the context of the commission is that we have you know, these big social media platforms which are run on a for-profit business model and they've been hugely successful. They also have been hugely manipulated uh, in ways that have, have been very uh, negative, have had very negative consequences. We think it's time to start thinking about how we could build public civic social media um, as a complement, not as a replacement, but as a complement to the for-profit. In the same way, you know, with a simple analogy that public television and public radio were created as a complement to the for-profit networks of the time. And um, this is something that I think really bears further thinking. And I'm sure Vivian Schiller and her team at Aspen are hard at work at these kinds of things. It's fundamentally important. And of course, Nancy Lindbergh, before becoming CEO of, of Packard, was the leader of uh, the Institute of Peace. Right. And so was in a position to be looking at this problem from, from the point of view of um, you know, foreign adversaries who that, that may gain feel they gain advantage by our losing faith in one another and in our system. Yeah, and how uh, disinformation can fuel conflict around the world, right? Yeah. You know, is this part of of civic culture though? Is is it having is. the sophistication to know uh, and the sense of res responsibility to know that you shouldn't be forwarding something uh, that you don't know to be true. Yes, uh, something that is is divisive uh, or, or liking it. I mean, that's a it's a set of individual choices uh, will be part of making a difference, and that's hard. Like mask wearing. That's it's, right. It, it, it's it's about the norms uh, and behaviors of of democratic citizenship, which are really really important. And I think another component of this, and the there is now encouraging work being done on this, and it was a major focus too of the commission is the movement for a more robust process of lifelong civic education because that can contribute to the habits of the heart as de Tocqueville referred to them of, of being a democratic citizen and the choices that you do make and how you do sift through information and what you rely on and what you question and so it, I think that's a very important dimension to this too. I, I, I love the fact that you called it lifelong, because often when people think of civic education, they're thinking about it in schools and that'll solve it all. But in fact, it turns out that the folks who are forwarding disinformation are often baby boomers yes. <laughs> who did have civic ed education way back when. Right. Uh, so the notion of it being lifelong, I think is really important. Yeah. The, the, um, 
you you touched on on one of the ways in which we we're expressing our generosity differently and and, and that that's a sort of mutual aid you know if you're part of an apartment building you look out for each other particularly if there's somebody elderly that would need to be taken uh taken to get uh her vaccines or uh pick up groceries for them um and there's been a real explosion of these mutual aid societies but you also talked about solidarity and i think um the the hard question is well well you know, the, uh, what is it called? Proud Boys could could see itself um, as as promoting a solidarity uh, amongst their own, a powerful sense of identity. Ku Klux Klan, way back when. Um, you know, there there is a potential dark side. How do we think about that? Yeah, you're you're right about that. We have to think about those um, in the context of what it means to be a democratic society. That a democratic society is about rights, it's about participation, it's about inclusion, it's about fairness, it's about justice. And so the things that are contradictory to those fundamental elements of a democratic society are not, um, they're not appropriate forms of civic identity. They, they don't contribute to the common good, they contribute to a disintegration of the common good. And we have to, people have to make judgments about this. I, I'm not suggesting we outlaw these things, although some of their activities are in fact illegal. Um, and we will certainly see this as the um, prosecutions related to January 6th and the investigations unfold. Um, but we have, to, we have to stand up and say, no, this is not appropriate in a democratic society and we have to denounce it. Um, we can't ignore it. So one of the other things is that there's this emergence of, of, of mutual aid societies that do suggest that there's this, um, that there is, there is generosity that can't be killed by, by, by hard times. I mean, in fact, that it comes out. But another one has been um, the, the capacity, the sort of online giving, uh, crowdfunding, uh, you, you know, in, in Oakland, California, uh, there was an elderly Asian American woman who was injured by, uh, assaulted. Um, and immediately uh, there was a GoFundMe campaign uh, to cover her medical expenses and, uh, and her own security. Um, th there's a new kind of giving happening. Uh, and then of course you have Giving Tuesday, which, which was more giving to nonprofits, but it's giving online and yeah. in the, the increase is extraordinary year over year. What do you make of, of that trend? Well, I think those are encouraging trends. I, I think that, um, you know, the, this is, these are reflections of what I was speaking about in the previous question, which is, this is these are people standing up and saying, this is not right. And here's what I'm gonna do about it. So an Asian American woman gets attacked on the street. It's a hate crime. There, you know, there's the possibility of prosecution, but whether it's prosecuted or not, citizens are saying, this is not right. This is not what it means to live in a democratic society. And what I'm gonna do about it is help support this woman. And I, I think that's a reflection of the, the better angels of American democratic culture. Um, but they are in competition with the, you know, with the negative forces and um, it's a contest. And we, you know, Bob Putnam's new book, I think is, is very instructive in this regard, you know, just, just to simplify his analysis, you know, the, the trends over time between a, a we culture and an I culture, um, a sense of, you know, we always have said part of what makes Americans Americans is this individualism in society. And that's true, but when individualism becomes narcissism, you lose the in society part. It becomes individualism only for the benefit of the individual as opposed to individualism while contributing. And, and the trends that Bob and his colleague um, document, it, you know, with, with a tremendous amount of data, suggest that we're kind of at the apotheosis of the I period. Um, but I like seeing these, you know, these um, these indications that, that the we is there, that that is being revived, that people are struggling against this 
uh, individualistic, narcissistic, um, self-centered focus, and and ultimately, that's a that's a contest we have to win. And you're you're seeing this in in the online activism. You're seeing the the, the desire to help one another to work on something that's larger than than oneself. I think about the color of change, which is um, it's got what seven million members. That's extraordinary. Uh, yeah. All, all in a very short period of time, yeah. um, all, all sort of developed online, um, but not, not uh, somehow distant at all. Right. You know, very, very connected. Is, is this the sort of thing you're expecting much more of in the future, particularly with um, a generation that is so technology, that are so connected to technology? I certainly hope so. You know, I, I think what Rashad Robinson and his colleagues have done at Color of Change is nothing short of brilliant. And, um, and I certainly hope that that is the kind of um, model that, that is proliferated, that's developed, that's, um, you know, that there are ongoing experiments with how to use these tools in ways that bring people together, as opposed to using the tools to divide people, which is what some groups, uh, you know, uh, cynically do. Um, and I think that is encouraging. And the fundraising that's now happening online is extraordinary. Even, you know, if we think about trying to dilute the influence of money in politics, part of it is by trying to increase the significance of small money in politics. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. happening online uh, in really impressive ways. So these are encouraging things that just need to be expanded and developed and supported um, and need to evolve as conditions change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is part of the, the, the solution to or the antidote to the drop off in middle class giving that was experienced pre COVID. Exactly. And now, I mean, that Giving Tuesday giving hasn't quite filled that gap, but it's certainly on, on the way to doing, to doing so. Um, you know, we've talked about process. I mean, democracy is about process, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's about a commitment to, to act in such a way and to, and to treat citizenship as a very active. Uh, form of engagement. But you've kind of answered this question, but I want to make sure I've, I, I put a fine point on it. One can't help but ask, but to what end? What, 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 why, why make this commitment to this one set of processes? And it seems to me that it, what I've heard you say both today and in other settings is, well, the end is justice. Um, is that right? Or is there, what, what is the, you know, the ultimate purpose of this work for you? Yeah, well, it, it is justice in the largest sense of, of the term. It is, about, um, it is about inclusivity as opposed to exclusion. It is about social solidarity as opposed to um, extreme disparity. It's about progress. It's about human dignity and the value of each individual life. And um, I think democracy is the, flawed as it is, is the best way to, to, um, to realize that aspiration. We will never fully achieve it, but we can realize the aspiration. We can move toward it. The, the idea of a more perfect union, the notion of perfectibility, it's not something, you don't become perfect, but you can keep striving toward yeah. perfectibility. And that to me is what democracy offers people. And um, it, when, it, when it's working, it is, there's, there's nothing more powerful and uh, nothing more encouraging. And that's why it's, it's been resilient in the, to the extent that we have now had this experiment ongoing for 240 years or so. Um, the question is, can we, can we now reinvent our democracy so that the experiment is resilient for the kinds of challenges we face in this century, like the pandemic, which will be the first of others, like climate change, which will have very serious effects. Um, and like so many other things we can't anticipate and the ongoing pandemic of racial injustice. So I, th I love the fact that you use the word reinvent. Um, many foundations, a lot of your colleagues, and I know you're a part of these conversations, are, are asking the question, how do we reimagine democracy? They're not saying democracy is no good. They're saying it's right. a good. Right. 
everything. Um, and so but it's not about fixing it either, because um, you know it, it was never good enough, right? We we had um, you know the origin story of of enslavement and the Native American genocide. We've had racial discrimination. We had gender discrimination. We had discrimination against people because of their sexual identity, et cetera. So it was, it's not about going back to something. Um, it is about looking forward and saying, what do we need in our system of self-governance to be able to have the quality of life as a society we desire in the 21st century? And that's why it's reinvention. Um, and, and we, it, it, you know, a number of historians have looked at the history of American democracy and they talk about three foundings, the, the original founding, the, the constitutional amendments during reconstruction as a second founding, and then the major civil rights legislation of the 1960s as a third. And it's interesting that that's one founding per century. And in each one of those foundings, race was at the center. And we at the, at the commission, and I personally believe that what we really need is a fourth founding, a 21st century founding of American democracy. And again, race is at the center and we have to make racial justice a core of this fourth founding. It has to be the essence of the fourth founding in many, many ways. And of course, that's what, what color of change has been, has been yeah. focused on. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not going to ask you. We, you know, I started by giving this, this sort of very fast bio uh, of you, and I, I want to ask a somewhat more personal question of your own, um, how you see your own role um, as as the head of the leading foundation, um, and how you walk the talk on all these issues. I mean, I'm aware, for example, that several years ago, you put together a group of foundation CEOs that crossed the ideological spectrum. Um, you 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 wanted to to be sure that as, uh, that you and that others would have the opportunity um, to themselves um, uh, promote dialogue across difference and see where uh, where the agreement might be, where the values might be shared. What has that meant to you? What has come of that? Uh, is that ongoing? Um, are, are there particular outcomes, or is it the process that's the value? Mm. Well, it's been a it's been a, a wonderful experience, and I'm really grateful to my colleagues who have been part of this conversation starting in the fall of 2017 and ongoing. Um, I have I have come to know people I would not otherwise I think have known because of the different circles we travel in because we have different perspectives on a variety of things. Um, I've learned a lot from them. You know, the idea was if, if we have such deep divisions in American society, can philanthropy do things to try to help heal those divisions? And if we can, should we look at divisions within philanthropy itself and see if by at least managing and working with those divisions, we could collectively among kind of self-selected coalitions of the willing um, do things together that would both mirror um, a, a, a kind of bridging of difference and promote things in society that also bridge difference. And, you know, these things can only move at the speed of trust. And so I would say a lot of this process has been about trust building among the participants first and foremost. And that has really developed in some ways that I think are actually quite profound and, and beautiful. Uh, and that has led once, you know, kind of trust was established, it has led to coalitions of the willing working on different topics. Um, and that has included some, you know, some very interesting um, combinations of foundations working together um, on certain things. So there are some very specific examples that have come out of that. I wouldn't not trying to claim credit for them exclusively through this set of conversations, but I think it's contributed to the ability of foundations with, you know, more right of center uh, inclinations or more centrist inclinations or more progressive inclinations to listen to each other, to learn about the things that motivate and animate the things that are different about us and to see if there are 
things that we do agree on that we can work together on. And that's been very encouraging. You know, it's small scale in a way, but um, it's, been a, it's been a process I'm really grateful for. Well, and I think earlier in the conversation, you did highlight the value of the small scale work, the civic bridges that are being built locally. Absolutely. A lot of it is, is the sort of uh, many, many small experiences. Yeah. And Jane, I, I want to add one other dimension to your question about what, what you know, a, a philanthropic leader can do. The other thing is we have to pay attention to these issues in the internal organizational culture of our foundation. And that is something that we have been putting a lot of time and energy into at the RBF over a multi-year period, and it has not been easy. You know, I, we, we have learned some things about our culture that were very disturbing to me and to my other colleagues, because as diverse as we are, um, when we really examine this closely, um, we found that we weren't as inclusive as we thought we were, that people didn't share the same sense of belonging across differences largely around race and gender, and um, that we have work to do to, to repair that, to overcome that, and we are engaged in that work. Um, but I think if we don't look at ourselves first, um, we can't do the work in society that needs to be done. And, and when I say look at ourselves, I mean, we have to look at ourselves individually. I have to look at myself as a as a white leader who has benefited from white privilege my entire life. I have to look at the institution I lead and I also have to look at the society I live in and I have to try to make a difference in all three of those dimensions. And I think all institutions are going through that. Uh, I, I know that you're your colleagues in the uh, Aspen Philanthropy Group have, have raised this themselves, so the importance of, of, of having that sort of internal alignment with the values that they're expressing through their grant making or their words, their voice. Um, and, and we at the Aspen Institute are, are experiencing this. I mean, uh, non yeah. nonprofits are, are going through this and it's a, it's a really healthy thing. It's it really healthy, <laughs> but it's not easy. And if, if, it's, if, if you're experiencing it as easy, you're not doing it, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but it's so important to do. Um, and it is healthy. And ultimately, it, it, it can be very joyful. Um, and that's also a, a, a wonderful experience. Well, as you know, we've, we've put together a 12 program consortium within the Aspen, uh, the Aspen Institute to, to see how we can make the best contributions uh, to democracy. And we, we are learning much from our common purpose, from, from the commission's work, uh, from, from your grant making program and from others. So just wanna thank you for the, the knowledge that's being, uh, the knowledge and the commitment that's being conveyed because uh, we're all learning from it. So Stephen Hines, thank you so much for this time together. Jane, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. And, and I wanna thank all of my colleagues who've contributed to this because this is definitely a collective effort. As, as democracy is. As it should be, exactly. Okay, and I believe that this has uh, been recorded for those who uh, only were able to, to participate in some of it. So we will uh, get, get that, that, that word out to, to others on this call. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you.